family and welcome. We're Bob and Penny Lord and today we want to bring you back to the ninth century and one of the worst wounds the church ever suffered. The scandal of the cross which had to make Jesus and his mother Mary weep as they watched the mystical body of Christ break up. The beloved church in the East leave the Latin church or as it is better known the Greek schism. It is believed by historians that <coughs> Constantine's conversion to Christianity was for purely political reasons. With him as a convert to Christianity, he believed that all his subjects in the East and West would be won through membership and loyalty to the one church he'd adopted. This was never to come about. The Greeks from the East differed from the Latins in the West. Different kinds of people coming from diverse backgrounds and definitely culture. Constantine thought that his plan to unite the entire Roman Empire would be ensured with the founding of Constantinople. Wrong. Instead, because of his move of the imperial capital from Rome to Constantinople, irreconcilable differences and hurts began in the fourth century between the East and the West that linger, linger till today. While it's true the Pope was the leader of the entire Catholic Church, respected by the East as well as the West, because of the vast separation of miles, many times out of necessity, decisions were left up to and made by local patriarchs in the Eastern Church. Only in extreme circumstances when the patriarchs had a problem agreeing among themselves was the Pope called in to resolve their differences. This autonomous governing of the Church in the East would lead to split loyalties between fidelity to the supreme vicar of the Church and the local patriarchs. There were differences. So there were problems. Different rites separated the East from the West. In the West, they used the Roman rite. In the East, the Byzantine rite. As these rites had been used from the very beginning of the Church, both East and West accepted the legitimacy of the other's rite. But the sad truth was the diversity of worship made it difficult for them to pray together. Differences in the liturgy were most felt by the laity, both of the East and the West, who could not understand the language or framework of the other's Mass. Father Peyton once said, the family that prays together stays together. They couldn't pray together, so they didn't stay together. Christ's family fell apart. Different languages. When a problem arose, the Latin and the Greek arms of the Church often did not understand each other. And so a wall of misunderstanding went up. Representatives from the papacy found it almost impossible to learn Greek. And the most learned of the Greeks knew no Latin. They were all dependent on translators who could not always be trusted to interpret the essence or intent behind the words. At the councils, legates would only sign doctrinal doctrine documents with the condition they were not compromising themselves or their position. They did not trust because they did not understand. This lent an air of suspicion. The chasm between the two grew even wider. Mm. Nationalism and familism played a great role in the separation as men placed country before God and the eternal country and ancestral pride before the one and only true family. Do we not hear today in the United States that we are different from our European Catholic brothers and sisters with different needs and customs? How can a pope rule us, from, uh, rule us from Rome? What happened to the universal family we belong to? The Roman Catholic Church that makes us one body, one people. The infighting between good men proved Constantine's desire to unite all his subjects under one government impossible and the heart of Jesus broke as he saw his church split in two. Before the final break or schism in 1074, there were many schisms, many battles waged by the fallen angels to separate these beautiful children of Mary from their brothers and sisters in the West. But these were not enough to cause the break. No one could say it was because each side was not amply represented in Rome. In the four centuries following Constantine, not all the popes were Latin. Actually, most of them were Greek. Then what caused the tragic division? It was politics. The emperors of Constantinople demanded the Holy See be located in Constantinople. Although many of the local patriarchs were faithful to the pope, 
Sadly, the emperors had more loyalty from and exercised more influence over the majority of the churchmen in the East than did their pope. At first, the split was between Rome and the one see of the East, that is Constantinople, wanting supremacy or at least equality with Rome. But soon other sees of the East followed suit and the split became a tragic reality. It is important to keep in mind that this was mainly the work of ambitious and self-seeking emperors, not those great and holy men of the Church of the East who were and had always been faithful to Christ's Church and her teaching. Most of the early Church Fathers came from the East. They fearlessly and loyally defended the Church against heresies. The Church has honored seven of these saintly Fathers with the title Doctor of the Church. Three of them were bishops of Constantinople, St. John Chrysostom, St. Gregory Nazan, and St. Basil. Heresies after heresies over the centuries cropped up at the instigation of the emperors, but one by one they were put down. Nevertheless, when you chink away at the armor of the church, you weaken it. The shield of the church was finally to split in two, and we had what, we was, what is known as the Phocian Schism, which lasted from 857 to 867. How did it begin? The avalanche that had been threatening the church was just waiting for one pebble to be thrown down the mountain. On the feast day of the Epiphany in 857, Ignatius, Patriarch of Constantinople, refused communion to a high government official named Bardas. Now, Bardas happened not only to be the regent of the area, but nephew to the infamous emperor of the Roman Empire, Michael the Drunkard. No matter who he was related to, Ignatius had no other recourse but to refuse Bardas the sacraments, as he had been found guilty of having had incestuous relations. Bardas appealed to his uncle, the emperor, naturally. With the help of a bishop loyal to the emperor, Bardas trumped up false charges against Ignatius. The emperor used this to force Ignatius' resignation and exiled him. Bardas nominated his chief secretary, Photius, a layman, as Ignatius' replacement. At his insistence, the week before Christmas, 858 AD, the bishops ordained and consecrated Photius, monk, lector, subdeacon, deacon, priest, and bishop, all in six short days. Although Photius was a high-ranking official in the Byzantine government, he was not acceptable as Patriarch of Constantinople, as he had been appointed by the emperor. Not only was this rejected because it was coercively brought about through devious means, it was clearly an interference of state in matters of church, which the church had been battling for years. Photius was not accepted by the Patriarchs of the East. They appealed to the Pope. Photius counteracted by boldly advising the Pope he was the new Patriarch. The Pope, St. Nicholas I, sent legates to Constantinople to look into the situation. When they reported back to him, the Pope refused to recognize Photius. He declared Ignatius the rightful Patriarch and condemned Photius. The next 12 years were filled with the East and the Holy See of Rome leveling condemnations and excommunications at each other. Eight years after the disruption and destruction caused by Bardas, his uncle, the Emperor Michael, plotted to have him murdered. The following year, the Emperor was murdered by Basil from Macedonia, and when Basil became Emperor, he immediately deposed Photius from his see as Patriarch and recalled Ignatius. He thought by reinstating Ignatius, he would gain the support of the many faithful who never stopped being loyal to their Patriarch in exile. After he was restored as Patriarch, Ignatius asked Pope Adrian II, Pope Nicholas I's successor, to convene a council to settle the matter of who was truly the Patriarch of Constantinople. The Eighth Ecumenical Council met in Constantinople in 869. It condemned Photius and those who had embraced his philosophy. And although the bishops showed clemency to his followers, they excommunicated Photius. As for Ignatius, he had fought the good fight, and it was time. A very tired warrior, he died on October the 23rd, 877. Because of his sanctity, his relentless defense of and unwavering loyalty to the church, Ignatius was added to the calendar of martyrs and raised to the communion of saints. His feast day, October 23rd, 
is still celebrated by Roman Catholics of Constantinople and also Byzantines faithful to the Catholic Church and those Greek Orthodox temporarily separated from us. With St. Ignatius gone, for the expediency of peace and unity, Photius was recognized by Rome as Patriarch of Constantinople. Now Photius caused a ripple in the church that would grow into a tidal wave which would nearly sink the ship of the church. His writings were accepted as doctrine, not only by the Greeks of his time, but long after he was dead. The charges of heresy he made against the Latin church had a tremendous effect on the schism of his day and also influenced schisms that never stopped fermenting. One of his heresies that persists till today, separating is the Greek belief that the Holy Spirit comes from the Father alone and not from Jesus. Now the early church fathers, St. Augustine being one of them, strongly wrote of the equality of the three persons in the one God. Photius contended that because the Latin church added to the, to the decree and the Son, it was teaching heresy. He maintained that the Holy Spirit emanated from the Father alone. He charged that by adding and the Son to the creed, the church was taking away from God the Father. Now how can this be since Jesus plainly said that he and the Father are one. Remember when Philip asked to see the Father, Jesus said, to have seen me is to have seen the Father. Was not Photius calling Jesus a liar? Jesus spoke of sending the Holy Spirit when he said, it is much better for you that I go. If I fail to go, the paraclete will never come to you. Whereas if I go, I will send him to you. Each of the members of the Catholic Church, both East and West, had always respected each other's rituals. Now Photius was saying the Latin Church's rituals were evil. Because of his following within the Eastern Church, soon his words were no longer looked on as one man's opinions, but dogma, and the rift widened. Although it seemed that the East and the West would again be one, the fracturing of the family had begun. The stones in the walls of the church had been loosened. And there were those who, for their own purposes, would continue to look for weaknesses in the structure where they could strike. They fanned the fires of disobedience as they added coals of division and discontent. A movement of separatism, the Church of the East against the Church of the West, had begun and would continue to spread, not satisfied until Christ's Church was destroyed once and for all. It's the 11th century, and the Church is split asunder. The year 1043 was to usher in a schism which made that of Photius look like child play. Michael Serolorius, a very strong, outspoken adversary of the Pope in Rome, became Patriarch of Constantinople. Upon assuming his role as Patriarch, he immediately began writing letters of division directed against the West. It was really an attack on the Pope. As with most heresies the Church combats, believing they have died only to see them resuscitated again, sometimes under a new name, the conflict between the East and the West of the ninth century would not die. The patriarch Serolorius broke off relations with the Holy See and the Latin Church. He refused to accept the Pope as the final authority. He publicly denied the primacy of the Pope. How could Serolorius get the faithful to follow him? He attacked the Church with false accusations and recriminations and forced a showdown by issuing ultimatums to the Pope. Like locusts, discontent and disobedience were devouring and destroying much of the God and Mother Church had tended for centuries. Nothing would be left of the unity and love that our Lord had prayed for before he died. And so Jesus' suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane was not enough. Now he knelt in another garden and cried. Serolorius exhumed Photius heresies regarding the Holy Trinity and accused the church once again of heresy. Adding some of his own heresies, Serolorius dealt the death blow. He would separate the mystical body of Christ, attack the Eucharist, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus who makes us one. He claimed by the church consecrating unleavened bread, Jesus was not truly present in the Holy Eucharist. Now, I really can't understand how he justified that. The Last Supper, which Jesus shared with the apostles, was a reenactment of the first Passover. In the Old Testament, we hear, the Lord told Moses, 
You shall celebrate this feast each year of this, to remind you of this fatal night. The celebration shall, shall last seven days. For that entire period, you are to eat only bread made without yeast. Anyone who disobeys this rule at that time during the seven days of the celebration shall be excommunicated from Israel. This annual celebration with unleavened bread will cause you always to remember today as the day when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. Only bread without yeast may be eaten from the evening of the 14th day of the month until the evening of the 21st day of the month. For those seven days, there must be no trace of yeast in your home. During that time, anyone who eats with anything with yeast in it will be excommunicated from the community of Israel. Jesus sat down with his disciples to a Seder, the first meal of Passover, the feast commemorating the exodus of the Jews from captivity. The Jews at the time of Exodus, in accordance with the law, baked and served unleavened bread. Jews each year, remembering their ancestors' flights from e captivity in Egypt by eating the foods they had eaten. At the Last Supper, the same unleavened bread that Jews have been eating for thousands of years was the bread Jesus blessed and broke, saying as he gave it to the disciples, this is my body to be given for you. Do this as a remembrance of me. Sarah Loria's next step was to destroy the priesthood. For without our priests, we have no mass. Without the mass, we have no Eucharist. He came out against celibacy of priests. To those who think celibacy is an unreasonable demand upon the priesthood, we, rem we remind you our priests represent our Lord Jesus in persona Christi. What was our Lord's pain in the Garden of Gethsemane when his trusted three, Peter, James, and John, fell asleep, leaving him quite alone to suffer? Jesus was thrown into a dungeon without light, without human companionship, his friends having deserted him. The one to whom he had entrusted the keys of the kingdom, the rock that he would build his church upon, Peter, had denied him. You talk of alone and wounded. Maybe today we have priests leaving the priesthood because we have removed the cross from our churches. And in those we have not, we have removed the crucified Christ. When the struggle becomes difficult for us, when we see the Judases who betray our church, the Peters, James, and Johns who fall asleep, the disciples who run away rather than share in Christ's walk to the cross, when we wonder what we are doing, sometimes we have only to look at the dear Lord Jesus crucified on the cross. And the tears we shed are not for ourselves, but for our Jesus and his sorrowful mother. Our hearts bleed for our Lord, who once again is rejected, bruised, and battered. Patriarch Serralorius instigated the priesthood against the papacy, causing many to leave the Latin church and join his newly formed Eastern church in de facto schism. He thrust another sword into Jesus and Mary's side. He had to be certain there would be no church of the Latin rite left in Constantinople. He closed them all down. The Eucharist and the priesthood were maligned. His children were deprived of his house, of his word, and then his holy Eucharist. Each attack upon the church was another blow that struck Jesus brutally at the pillar. But the final death blow was still to be dealt. <clears throat> Our Lord was, has, was yet to receive his deepest hurt. Just before Serralorius closed the Latin churches, he took consecrated hosts out of the tabernacle threw them to the ground and trampled them underfoot. He had denied Jesus was present in hosts consecrated of unleavened bread. It didn't matter that they had been consecrated. It didn't matter to him that they were faithful in his see who still believed our Lord was truly present in these hosts. Had he no heart for the pain he inflicted upon them? On the day of his ordination when he professed the creed, he vowed to uphold and teach that our Lord is truly and permanently present in a consecrated host. When we receive him, or when the host is reserved in the tabernacle, or in a monstrance for the faithful to worship, in betrayal of that oath and in disdain of Jesus' word, he trampled his Lord's body. When we desecrate our Lord in his holy Eucharist, are we not killing our Lord in an unbloody manner, but killing him 
Nonetheless, the Pope at the time, St. Leo IX, began to study Greek in an attempt to understand the arguments presented by Serolarius. He wrote him an impassioned letter, cautioning and alerting him to the seriousness of the sin, and the far-reaching consequences of the schism he was proposing, and reiterated the supremacy of the papacy. Serolarius rejected the Pope's mandate to submit to his authority. He counted with a demand that he, the Patriarch of Constantinople, be made equal with the Pope. The Pope could remain head of the Western Church, and he, as Patriarch of Constantinople, was to have fully autonomous jurisdiction over the Church in the East. The Pope sent delegates to Constantinople to look into the matter. Serolarius and the legates from Rome agreed to disagree, and he ended the meeting with the final blow to the papacy. He er erased the Pope's name from the liturgy of the Mass. On July the 16th, 10, 1054, Cardinal Umberto, the Pope's spokesman, excommunicated Serolorius. In turn, Patriarch Serolorius excommunicated the Cardinal and all the legates from Rome. The church split in two. As in civil court, when two adversaries seek justice, no one wins. So it was with our beloved church. Brother against brother, did they realize what was begun that infamous day was to have the far-reaching, devastating finality which separates us till today? They say the most unforgiving are those who are part of a family. Those who have loved much sadly hate much. With God as our Father and Jesus making us brothers and sisters and Mother Mary as our mother, all the members of the church are family. And no matter if we call ourselves by another name, we still are family by virtue of our baptism. Whenever we have met someone who has left the church, we encounter anger against the church. Could it be because they are, they are upset because they are no longer part of Mother Church? Do they not know she loves them and like the father of the prodigal son in Holy Scripture is just waiting for them to come back home? As Pope John XXIII had once been papal nuncio to the East, they were very dear to his heart. To effect reconciliation, he declared that both sides, East and West, shared in the misunderstandings that came about when the East and the West split. In addition, on December the 1st, 1965, Pope Paul VI, together with the Patriarch from uh, the Greek Church, said yes to the Holy Spirit and mutually rescinded the excommunications that East and West had imposed in 1054. Nine centuries later, how much law longer? St. Augustine's words echo the Lord's sacred heart. How long, how long shall I go on saying tomorrow and again tomorrow? Why not now? Why not have an end this very hour? In every century, in every period of our church and world, you hear more problems and problem makers than of those faithful servants who use their Lord and His Church without question day in and day out. Today, it seems all we hear is bad news, and we forget there is good news. Even at Jesus' time, people killed the good news, who was Jesus Christ Himself. But as with our dear Lord, the good news lives after eternally, and the bad news goes where it belongs to Gehenna. We would like to share a part of a homily we heard at Mass on Trinity Sunday. It is a good thing that we have this annual Sunday in honor of the Holy Trinity. Most of the year we get by without worrying about God's inner life. We are grateful that God is God and we don't bother too much with what He is like when we receive, recite the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed. In that we express the Holy Trinity by saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. They open up a treasury of divine measures. These holy mysteries call to us and tell us to be silent and to take off our shoes, that we are on holy ground. Both of these creeds are very ancient, having been formulated in the first three centuries of Christianity. They were formulated in response to various heresies which arose during the apostolic age. 
The creed became a formal expression of what the disciples believed, a summary of the faith which they and we profess. To be wise is to face the eternal mysteries of life <clears throat> and faith with at least enough humility to admit we do not have the answer for everything that asks a question in life. Faith is God's gift to us, and it seeks understanding. It does not require understanding. More than a work of the mind, faith is also an act of our will. Catholics must be willing to accept the mysterious. The mystery of the Holy Trinity is something we understand more with our hearts than our intellect. We know God through the expressions of the heart, the individual heart of each person, the heart of his church, and the heart of his church's authority to teach. St. Augustine reminds us God is love. What outward appearance, what form, what stature, hands or feet has love? None of us can say, and yet love has feet which takes us to do good things in this world. Love has hands which give to the poor. Love has eyes which give us knowledge of those in need. The Catholic faith is filled with mystery. The mystery is described and proclaimed in the creed. The creed is a summary of what we believe in. It is a true expression of the church's heart. The creed tells us and the world the divine plan by which we are saved in Christ. It tells us the story of our salvation and is prayed universally by all believing people. The creed unites Catholics the world over in a unity of faith that gives us the only true purpose for living. When we give loving and faithful assent to the creed, we are transported out of the present time and mystically united with the faithful of every time and place. We thank you, Father Ken Harney, for this homily. This is what we believe and have believed for the last 2,000 years. Rejoice and be glad and allow no one to take it away from you. We love you. Come home, brothers and sisters of the East. We need you. See you next week. Thank you, family, for watching. This is just one of over 200 books and videos available here at Journeys of Faith. Now, these are perfect tools for evangelization and give them as gifts for birthdays, confirmations, First Holy Communion. Anytime you think of a gift, give one of these tools of evangelization. Write us at the address on our screen or call us in the United States at 1-800-633-2484.